Well, Mike has asked me to uh, have you look at several passages today uh, in preparation for our study. First one is 1 Samuel 19, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Again, that's 1 Samuel 19, and we're looking at verses 1 through 7. Now Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father is seeking to put you to death. Now, therefore, please be on guard in the morning and stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. And if I found out anything, then I shall tell you. Then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Do not let the king sin against his servant David, since he has not sinned against you, and since his deeds have been very beneficial to you. For he took his life in his hand and struck the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by putting David to death without a cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul vowed, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these words. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as formerly. Now we're going to look at the second passage, and that is over in 1 John. So turn over in 1 John, and we're going to look at verses, well, first of all, chapter 17. And we're going to look at verses or just verse 9. Sorry about that. The Lord is speaking. I'm going, to look, I'm going to read verse 8 before this. For the words you gave me, I have given them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask, this is our verse, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom thou hast given me, for they are yours. Then finally, we're going to look at Come on, phone, light up. <laughs> All right. I, can, I think I flipped over to it here. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians verses, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read verse 3 as well. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I brought uh, some more of these action Bibles. If you read the Bible to your grandchildren, um, we have a couple here. Let Mark or Dan know if you want one, if you didn't get one this morning. Um, and we'll try to get those to you throughout the summer as uh, the need is. Uh, our text this morning is uh, 1 Samuel 19. This is the 14th lesson that we have together, the rise of David a king without a kingdom. And uh, because we're at a beginning of a new chapter, I thought we would do a quick review where we started. So if you'd flip back a couple of pages to 1 Samuel 16, here is where we began our study. We found him, David, the least of all his brothers. He was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the chosen king. And after that event of anointing, the Spirit of God came upon him, came over him. That's verse 13. And he came to public attention at the remarkable defeat of the giant Philistine warrior Goliath. That was chapter 17. And as a result, he now comes into the service of Saul the king himself. 
That's 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 2. And at least at the beginning, all was positive as he continued to succeed in warfare. Uh, Saul had a terrible jealousy break out and he tried to kill David with a spear. And that is 1811. He decides rather than kill David himself, the better part of it, let the Philistines do it. And so he offers his eldest daughter Merib as incentive for David to go out and fight the Philistines. Uh, 1817, he offers his oldest daughter, we might say incentive, probably a better word would be bait, uh, to go out and fight with the idea that the Philistines will do David in. But David is resilient, he is victorious, and his career continues to expand, and he becomes more and more popular. We began to open our last lesson when we were together at 1819 with Saul rescinding the offer of his oldest daughter, Merib, and rather he was, she was given to a man by the name of Adriel, not a Hebrew name, probably some political alliance, but we're not absolutely sure. Only to find that daughter number two, Michal, loved David, and so Saul devised a new scheme for David's death. Kill 100 Philistine warriors. That's 1825. But David again was successful, making it a matter of record, he earned his way into the family. And last time we were together, we saw the window that the author put in the narrative. And David made a point of him earning himself into the royal family, 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 14. And with our last lesson, an important point of theology. 1828... Saul not only saw but knew that the success of David was the Lord himself. Saul, angry and frustrated by a lot of things, but behind it all, all the facades, all the excuses, he was angry with the Lord because he brought a man into his life with the potential to take his kingdom away. 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 9, he says to himself, what more can he have but the kingdom? Our Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, says, where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. Where was the heart of Saul the king? It was about the kingdom, his kingdom. Make no mistake, his kingdom. Paul, uh, Saul is the perfect representation of the modern day unbeliever. He knows the truth, he refuses to repent. That's what the Apostle Paul taught us in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through 21 that we looked at last time. Instinctively, we as natural people, apart from the Spirit of God, want to rule and reign over our lives. Don't tell me what to do with my body. Don't tell me who I can marry or not marry. I am not going to have some book, dictate my ethics, my life. It is mine to make my own decisions. It is life on my terms. That is Saul. And that's the heart of the man. In this now, the 19th chapter, where we begin today, 
we will have three episodes of rescue. David's going to need all three. Remembering our book, uh, The Mystery of Providence, John Flavel. Let's stop and consider David's times because they are actually our times as well. Providential powers are in place on and over us. Saul is the illegitimate king, still the authoritarian in power. Nothing changed at David's anointing. God left Saul in that power with David being the righteous king and the new king and the authoritarian king, but he is under the full force and government of the wicked hand of Saul. That's the providence. David will overcome, just like you and I overcome, by trusting and believing in the Word of God that was delivered to us. And what was the Word of God that was delivered to David? You will be king. What are the promises that you embrace, that you know from the Word of God, and you have taken them unto yourself? You say, this will never happen. Isn't that what David would say? Why, me being king as a shepherd boy, that's a, that's a human impossibility. We now have a king. He will rule and reign over us all the days of my life. And so for many, many, many years, David saw his life as being a king as virtually impossible. But in time, God fulfilled His Word. What do you think He's doing with you? Are you in dark providences today? Does it seem as if you can't ever break free from the oppression that you have? Study the life of David because this is the providence of God that He put him under. David will emerge victorious because he believes the Scriptures. You and I will emerge victorious by following the Word of God and not the dictates of men. So here is, in this chapter, the providences that are forcing David. And the lesson for you and me, the forces of darkness that are controlling are over us, the providences of God. What do we learn? We learn from David. And what are they? Stay under the trial. Submit to it. Submit to the providence that God has put you under. He is making you for a purpose to go through them. David is the greatest king in all of the earth. And these next 15 years of difficulty, trial, hardship, suffering, tears, are necessary to make him the king that God wants him to be. Are you in tears frequently? Feel a lot of pain? God is making you valuable. And He's preparing you for the next thing. So here we are. The first deliverance of the 19th chapter is our lesson for this morning. Verses 1 through 7, Jonathan. The second will be Michal. Verses 8 through 18. And the third, the Spirit of the Lord Himself. Verses 19 through 24. 
I want you to see that the first two rescues are closely connected by vocabulary. Let me give you the key words, because the key word is what the Spirit is showing you that He is driving the narrative. This is what behind the scenes is the way the wind is blowing, we might say. The first is the key word to try or to seek. We see it this morning in verse 2. Next time we'll see it in verse 10. The second is the verb to kill. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 6. Next time it'll be in 11, 15, and 17. The key words tell us the tenor of the chapter. The hostility of Saul has broken out. Kill David. What started as his own private thought has now become public policy. Something that we learn from our study together in the Proverbs. Man never remains in neutral. He is always moving every day of his life, either toward righteousness or decadence. As a man thinks, said the Proverbs, so is he. Now look, verse 1, line 2, but Jonathan, there's your contrast. He's Saul's son. He made a covenant commitment to David, and now that bond is going to be tested. Identified here at the very moment his friend is challenged taking David's side even against his own father. What is striking to me is he didn't have to ponder it. He didn't have to pray about it. He instantly knew what he had to do. You see, he had a higher loyalty than just be a son to his father. He pledged covenant faithfulness to David, and that was unconditional. The term of the Old Testament word is hesed, H-E-S-S-E-D. God expects us to do the same. Hosea chapter 6 in verse 6, for I desire hesed, covenant faithfulness, Loving kindness. It's a word from heaven. It can't be defined by men. It's an amalgamation of 26, 27 different concepts. In the New Testament, our Lord Jesus Christ morphs this word or this concept into one word for us. Friends. John chapter 15 and verse 15, I call you, he said to his disciples, friends. Without the education and the study of Hesed, I don't think we grasp the full effect of the word friends. So in the weeks to come, in our study of David, we will try to amplify on covenant faithfulness. My friend may have made a mistake. My friend perhaps did something wrong, even legally wrong. But he's my friend. And he gets my full pledge of loyalty. Unconditionally. He can give nothing to me. I give Him my all. When you say, I have your back, what do you mean by that? Jonathan is a great man in the Scriptures. We have much to learn from him. In chapter 18, verse 22, as part of Saul's manipulation, he told his servants, 
Say to David, the king delights in you. Now, here is that same word, delight. To bite the hand of Saul. Remember how we saw it last time? In the context that it came, Psalm 109, verse 17. If we use the words love and delight in a false manner, in a wicked motive, God's Word is a pledge and a promise that He who uses it will find it coming back upon Him. And here it is, His own Son taking the place of David in rebuke to His own Father and His orders. So Jonathan, without prompting, stands and most likely stands alone to defend his friend. What he does stands the test of time. That's why it's left for us to learn the concept of covenant loyalty. Verse 2, My father is seeking to kill you. Now be on your guard. As for me, I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I myself will speak to my father on your behalf and see what I should inform you of. I count the term my father three times in verse 2 and verse 3. The term... It, explains the close relationship that comes between the two of them. And yet there's something that supersedes that. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37. Here is our Lord Jesus speaking. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Who talks like that? Who can say that? Jonathan is a picture, a shard, a glimmer, a shadow, a reflection of the One to come. Our Lord Jesus Christ. The supremacy of Him above and beyond all relationships he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Now, the reality of the harsh words. Look at them. Verse 2. My Father is seeking to kill you. You are the enemy. Think about that. Do you see the blood drain out of David's face? Do you see the bewilderment in his eyes? If you don't, you're not reading the narrative. The last thing on earth he thought he would possibly hear. The shock of the moment. A few weeks back, my wife went on a retreat. It's the second time she's done this with girls from high school that she had grown up with. Some of them are believers, some of them not. She particularly wanted to get one-on-one, -on -one, if the Lord would allow it, to one particular woman, unbeliever, who's had a very difficult life. Several marriages. She told my wife about her second husband. They had been married maybe a year when suddenly a man comes to the front door and identifies himself as a neighbor in the neighborhood. You don't know me, but I'm here to deliver through you a message to your husband. 
We now know where he lives. And we have traced him back to this residence. He has been at night going out looking through windows at our wives and daughters. We have taken it to the police. They say, unless you can catch him in the act, we can do nothing. So we have decided to do something about it ourselves. I am here to deliver a warning. Your husband is in grave danger. We will take justice into our own hands. He is to pack up and leave immediately if he wants to remain in any kind of health. Now imagine the shock. Look into the face of that woman in that moment. That's David's face. That's where he is. What do you do when you get that kind of a shocking message? Ah, you do exactly what David did here in the Scriptures. He listens to the voice of one who loves him unconditionally. That is the voice of Jonathan. David is passive. Jonathan is active. That's your friend. Now look at this. I will go out and stand, he said, beside my father. Look carefully at those words. On your behalf. You see the picture? You see what he's doing? He is interceding on behalf of David. The covenant that they previously made. 1 Samuel 18.3 They made a covenant commitment to one another. Now who does that? The one who does that is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 17 and verse 9. Now, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. That's the covenant. The covenant that He made with His Father before time began. Interceding, pleading the covenant between Father and Son previously made. Jonathan is a type. Jonathan is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ who pleads on behalf of another the terms of the covenant. The everlasting friend is the Lord Jesus Christ of Proverbs 17.17. 17. He who loves at all times, a brother born for the day of adversity, and who will never leave you or never forsake you. That's your Savior. We think friendship's foundations are built upon experience. We played on the same team together. We won and lost together as teammates. We walked through the streets of Fallujah in Iraq at 120 degrees guarding one another. We pulled one another through organic chemistry in college. We prepared the law exam and, uh, examination together. Those are common experiences. That's not what we're talking about here. Common experiences are not the bond of this friendship. The only bond of this friendship is common beliefs. And that's why you feel closer to people in the pew next to you than you do to your own family members. You are bonded together in Christ Jesus believing the same things. Here's verses 4 and 5. True to his word, Jonathan met with his father. 
His argumentation here is logical. It's sound. It's personal. It's persuasive. May my father not commit a sin against David. For David has not sinned against you. On the contrary, his deeds are very good towards you. He took his life into his hands. He defeated the Philistine. The Lord brought a great victory. You saw it. You rejoiced. Why would you commit a sin? Shedding innocent blood, killing David without a cause. He called it sin. He uses the word three times. Twice in verse 4, once in verse 5. The word means to miss the mark. Saul knew that word. He knew it well. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 24, he tells the prophet, I have sinned. The great irony to 1 Samuel, the greatest sin of all, Chapter 12 and verse 17, Israel asking for a king in the first place. Notice verse 4. He calls David his servant. That's noteworthy. Could have called him a warrior. Abigail certainly did. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 28, you fight the Lord's battle, she said. Could have called him his musician. When you closed down, when you stayed in your dark tent, when you cried out and called out, He came in and He played for you and soothed you. And the next thing we knew, you were fast asleep. He called David his servant. Bruce Walkie said that's the greatest epitaph in the Old Testament. Our Lord Jesus In Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, whoever will be great among you, let him be your servant, he said. And so it will be with David. We learn right here, we have it as a testimony to us all, a picture of the outflow of the self centered man in his heart. The Lord brought great victory, said Jonathan to his father. You rejoiced. You saw it. But you don't recall any of that, do you, Saul? You see, self-centered people don't give time and consideration to others. Because they're too consumed with themselves. That's why the rich man, Luke chapter 16, he had no trouble ignoring, walking around, stepping over Lazarus, covered with sores, lying in the street. Yeah, you could argue, well, come on. How do you think he could afford all that purple? He worked hard, and he worked hard for it. Yes, I guess he did. And if you're familiar with the parable, and you should be familiar with it, because Mark has already taught it to us, you know that he has all eternity, all eternity, to ponder all the things that he did how he spent his money, how he spent his time. All on the things that really didn't matter at all. Self-centered Saul saw David as an enemy. Jonathan said, David, your loyal servant, He's your loyal servant, Father, so that you can ride out in front of your army. So that they can sound the trumpets and wave the flags. He's 
your servant. Somewhere, somehow, someone did something for you in a time of need. But you know what I'm like? I'm like the cupbearer in Pharaoh's prison. I had a need. A man comes out and he extends kindness and goodness to me just like Joseph did to the cupbearer. He interpreted his dream for him. He was greatly agitated. He wanted more than anything in life to have that dream interpreted so he could understand it. And there was Joseph to do that. And I am just like the cupbearer. I forget. Just like he forgot Joseph and left him in that prison. People have done good things for me, kindnesses to me, and I've just forgotten them. But today, today we're before the Word of God. And today is a new day. And so we're going to write that letter. We're going to send that text. We're going to make that phone call. And we're going to say how much we respect and appreciate the kindness and goodness of people that have done for us. Because that's who we are. We are the people of grace that have grace upon grace extended to us that cannot be earned but done all by a covenant Father and His Son in behalf of us. Here's verse 6, And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore as the Lord lives. Let me just pause here and comment on that phrase. As the Lord lives, it occurs 16 times. And Samuel, the first occurrence of that term in the Bible is Judges chapter 8, verse 19, used by Gideon. What is it? It's an oath. It's a pledge. You stood before witnesses and before God Himself, and you pledged yourself to a woman. You made a public commitment to that. Today we'll have a baptism. You are making a public commitment before witnesses, before the Lord Himself, you are making an oath. This is who I am, and this is the way I will live my life. Why is an oath so important? Psalm 15, verse 4. Because the righteous man keeps his oath, even to his own hurt. You see, the pledge of faithfulness is more important than my comfort or my ease. That's the psalmist. Saul says he shall not be killed. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan informed him of these things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul. Our Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers. That's Jonathan. That's Jonathan. I read these commentaries, try to read broadly to get the details of the story, to understand everything that's going on. I was particularly amused by this line from a commentary. Saul's paranoia and uncontrolled outburst manifest themselves in intermittent cycles. Intermittent cycles. In Dallas, Texas, we call that being plum crazy. You don't know what you're going to get with this guy. Any day, any hour, he's different. That's wickedness. Saul swore this oath. It won't last. 
Because he's not a righteous man. He's in it for the moment. Like everybody that is self-centered. I will say to you and do for you as I need to at the moment. No commitment. This is actually the second time that Saul made a first degree pronouncement of death as king. He sentenced his own son Jonathan to death. War broke out with the Philistines. Jonathan is all alone, surrounded by them. He stacks them up like cordwood. He is a great warrior. And after he demolishes all of them, he walks through the forest. He sees a honeycomb. He eats the honeycomb. The Scriptures, long before we knew what glucose was, or medical science determined what sugar in the body does, the Scriptures say he ate it and his eyes brightened. He got a sugar rush. He gets back to join his father and the other men only to learn that in the midst of the battle, his crazy father calls for a fast. You don't, you don't call for a fast in the middle of a battle. You feed your troops. You make sure they have plenty of fluids. You want all of their energy, but not this goofy guy. And so, what are we going to do? Your father called for a fast. What do you think dumb Saul did? Well, I've got to keep my word. Warriors interceded on behalf of Jonathan. Here's what they said. Why should he die? He led Israel in battle and brought a great deliverance. That's the wickedness of this man. So here now is the second time a military hero has been saved and spared because somebody intervened in his behalf. In bringing David into the presence of Saul, it's a proof that the crisis has now passed. The Scriptures again exonerate Jonathan and put him in the spotlight for us. Look at verse 7. His name is mentioned three times. Here is the inspired language. And Jonathan. And Jonathan. And Jonathan. He interceded for David. He protected David. He stands with, for, and next to David, the man. He is Jonathan, the magnificent. And he deserves all of our praise and admiration. This is a great man. But what made him great? What made him great? You see, when you've gone through the heartache, and the heartbreak, and the tears, and the blind side, and the shock. God has made you valuable for other people. Here's the way the Apostle Paul explained that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. And here's the purpose. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. The pain and the frustration of life. The tears that we go through. The heartache. The heartbreak. The disappointments. The discouragements. The attacks. 
You're an enemy. You're on the outside. We've met. We've determined it. You're no longer useful to us. Do you feel the pain? God knows what He's doing. The Apostle said, He's making you valuable. Valuable for others. Valuable for others so that you can come up alongside them and say what no one else can say. I know exactly how you feel. And I'm here for you. That's the value that you have in loyalty with Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for Your Word that teaches us righteousness, goodness, tells us to be hessed toward one another. Jesus, our Savior, Lord, call it friends. How we throw that term around and we don't even know what it means. Lord, teach us Your Word. Imbue Your Spirit upon our hearts that we would truly be friends to one another. Sensitive and kind. Save us from our self-centeredness. Our wicked hearts desire only ourselves. But Jonathan today is our example. He is our great leader. And He has taught us what You preserved in Your Word for us to learn. Covenant faithfulness. Covenant faithfulness to one another as we would be one together in Christ Jesus. And we thank You, Lord, for Your goodness and mercy of these men who behave like You behave. And they give us glimmers and shards of light and truth that we may better know Him who loved us faithfully, Christ Jesus. And it is in His name we pray. Amen.